Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to another edition of a reaction show which we've recently launched on Five Pillars. I'm Robert Carter and I'm also with the uh, one man machine, Roshan Mohammed Saleh, who's reacting with me today. And uh, let's dive straight on into the first topic, which of course is breaking news. It's literally uh, hit the headlines as of today, which is the announcement of a temporary ceasefire or truce between Gaza and the Israeli regime. Uh, just some of the details that we, we've seen being reported on this morning is that it will last about four days. Uh, at least uh, 50 Israelis are being swapped. There's like a, a, an exchange between uh, 50 Israeli captives and 150 uh, Palestinian uh, captives as well are being exchanged, all of which are women and children. Uh, however, the uh, Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu, has, has already stated that this isn't an end to the war. So let's not uh, refer to it as a proper ceasefire. This is a temporary halting of the fighting. Whilst the exchange takes place, some aid will be going into Gaza, I understand. But uh, Netanyahu has pledged to continue the war uh, and to continue to attack Gaza. So hostilities are likely to return in the near future. 13,000 people have been killed in Gaza so far. I believe actually it's past 14,000. But those uh, numbers uh, will have to double check. Uh, and millions have certainly been displaced. Uh, Roshan, let me bring you straight in on this because a lot's been happening over the past few hours. Just give me a reaction to uh, this so-called ceasefire. Well, alhamdulillah, you know, for four days at least, there'll be some relief for the people of Gaza from this relentless Israeli bombardment and massacre and genocide. So this four days will allow some humanitarian aid to get in via the Rafah border uh, in Egypt. Um, so that should provide some relief to, you know, people that are struggling, you know, and the, it's, the it's, injured in the hospitals, etc. It sounds like peanuts to me, to be honest with you. It is actually. peanuts. We shouldn't celebrate. I don't think we should celebrate. I mean, alhamdulillah, the, uh, the uh, you know, 150 Palestinian prisoners, or I call them hostages, will be, you know, released. There's this dichotomy. People are, you know, they're calling, uh, the mainstream media is calling the Israeli prisoners hostages. Whereas, oh, okay. yeah, whereas in, in fact, um, the Palestinians are hostages as well because they've been incarcerated by an illegitimate illegitimate occupation authority after sham trials. Sure. So we shouldn't fall into this trap of, of court saying, you know, um, Israeli prisoners, sorry, Palestinian prisoners, they are hostages held by the illegitimate state of Israel. That's uh, something which uh, I wasn't aware of, and simply because the Western mainstream media aren't reporting that, mm. so they haven't used that terminology from what I've seen. But this is something which we have known about for a long time, that the Israeli regime uh, captures Palestinians, jails them for, for silly reasons for nothing. Throwing stones. There's all sorts of accusations I've seen as well of uh, tri poor treatment of Palestinians whilst they're Absolutely. in uh, Israeli detention. Torture. Uh, torture, essentially. Uh, this never gets discussed, by the way. I've never seen Piers Morgan or yeah. any of these other mainstream journalists talk about it. They're only obsessed about October the 7th, uh, but they don't talk about all of the hostages yeah. that Israeli regime's been holding. Uh, uh, and they're, they're in the thousands as well, I believe. I think uh, there was around 6,500 Palestinian uh, captives, hostages in Israeli prisons. I think it's much more now. Uh, since October the 7th, I think it's going up to 10,000 because they've they've incarcerated a lot of people from the West Bank that have just been protesting. A lot of these prisoners, by the way, are women and children, you know, literally minors and yeah. women, not just men, not just hardened so-called terrorists, Hamas members, etc., etc. So, yeah, it's a massive scandal. But Alhamdulillah, uh, the, 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 the Palestinians are going to release, um, I think it's 50... Um, Israeli captives, yes. and in return, they're going to get 150 Palestinian hostages back from Israeli jails. Where do you think this is going to go? Because obviously Netanyahu has said that he wants to continue the war. Uh, he wants to hit these uh, objectives, which includes basically eliminating Hamas for good. Mm. Uh, if that's even possible, I don't know. But basically it looks like this war is, is well, this oppression, this attack, yes. uh, this uh, occupation of Gaza is going to continue. I think it will, yes. Um, I, I do sense a change in the international environment. Do, don't forget that ultimately Israel is a pawn 
of the West, uh, mm -hmm. and its major backer is the US. So if the political environment changes in the US, then Israel will be reined in. So I can, I mean, obviously there's been a lot of public pressure, political pressure. Uh, I think the Israeli bloodthirstiness is even a little bit too much for the Americans. So I do think at some stage, the Americans will rein them in, um, but that will probably not be for a while yet. Uh, so several more thousand deaths. Uh, but I don't believe that Israel would be able to achieve their war aims of elim eliminating Hamas. That's interesting. Now, not only that, but the, the conflict is, uh, I, I, I don't like using the term conflict because obviously this is, mm. uh, this is not an equal fight by any means. You know, the Palestinians are the oppressed, they are the occupied, they don't have the same military uh, capabilities as the Israeli regime. Uh, so this is oppression, there's no doubt about it. But it's massacre. The, yeah. It's a massacre, it's a genocide. Those are the right terms that we should be using. But it, it, the, the attack on Gaza is expanding into a regional situation there's a regional yes, conflict I think that Americans are wary about that as well there's been obviously we know about Leban Lebanon's uh, participation in the uh, north of occupied Palestine but Yemen and uh, the uh, government in Sana'a there uh, which is led by the Houthis mm. they have also entered into the war literally they've, they've they've just said okay we're at war with Israel now that's literally what they're saying they've uh, uh, captured uh, an Israeli-linked cargo ship. Yeah. They've fired rockets, ballistic missiles and drones at Israel as well. Mm. Uh, just tell me, Roshan, about that. How far do you see this going? Because other countries are now being drawn in. I think in a previous episode, we both kind of criticised regional countries, including the Iran-led uh, regional axis, of not doing enough. Mm. But I think we do have to acknowledge that they have done something and they are applying some pressure, whereas none of the Arab regimes or Muslim regimes are doing anything, you know. Uh, Hezbollah have applied pressure in the north. They've pinned down several Israeli battalions. The Houthis are doing something way down in the south. Uh, generally, the Iranian-led axis is applying some pressure on Israel. It's not just words. As far as Yemen is concerned, I'm, I've been to Yemen. I think my, my ancestors originally came from Yemen. When I went there, I think, I think the one thing that strikes me about the Yemenis is that they are, they've got nothing to lose. They're, they're a poverty-stricken people. They're not living in comfort. Um, they're a warlike people in the sense that they've been at war for a long time. They know how to fight. So I think if they were in the, the region of Sham, they would literally be, be fighting Israel directly and they'll be completely going for it. And they'll be ready for martyrdom, et cetera, et cetera. They're geographically, you know, quite a long way away. They're constrained by geography, obviously Saudi Arabia, you know, the massive Saudi Arabia landmass in between them and them and Israel. So they, they probably would be doing more if they were geographically closer. But I think, um, you know, there's a famous phrase, I'm not sure how it goes, like, you know, tough times produce tough people. And the Yemenis mm -hmm. are tough people. Whereas the Lebanese are a bit softer. The, the Iranians are a bit softer. The Arab world is very soft. You know, Turkey is soft because they, they have a lot to lose because they're already living in relative comfort. You know, economic comfort, material comfort. The Yemenis don't live in that kind of situation. So that's why they're going for it. And that's why they have nothing to lose and they're willing to die for Islam you know they're literally willing to die for, they love Islam and they're willing to die for Islam I think it's really crazy how the how Yemen has been attacked and there, there was the massive long uh, running war on Yemen for about nine years mm. uh, over a hundred thousand Yemenis have been killed in that fight and it was other Muslim countries like Saudi Arabia, for example, who was attacking Yemen. Yeah. Yet out of all of the Arab world countries, the only one that actually stood up for Palestine now is Yemen, the same country which all the other Arab countries yes. in the Gulf were attacking. It's actually that country which has now stood up. And I think there's this stigma, in obviously, in the Sunni world because they're seen as Iranian proxies. But I think that's uh, slightly unfair. I think there is quite a, a lot. I mean, first of all, um, the, the, the Yemenis are uh, Zaidi. Um, uh, they're not uh, Ithna Ashari Shias. Mm. Um, so there's a bit of a distance there. And also I think they, they work in qu quite a lot of autonomy. Obviously, some of the weapons that they're getting and money is obviously from Iran. So there's there's definitely that connection with Iran. But I would, ca would characterise the Houthis as Iranian allies rather than Iranian proxies. Let's see, because I know that there's a lot of speculation about how Israel will respond to Yemen and their involvement in uh, the, the fight for Gaza. Uh, there's some people who think that Israel eventually might hit Yemen directly, which mm. would be 
uh, I've, I've never known that. Just another day in the week for, for the Yemenis being bombed. Yes, yeah. and they have threatened to continue to escalate their role. So this really could spiral out of control. And I think that that... Uh, that the guy in the White House, uh, Sleepy Joe Biden, as they call him, mm. he seems to be so ignorant, uh, so naive, uh, so out of it when it comes to what's going on globally. I mean, all of this situation has happened under his watch. He's actually made Donald Trump look more he, responsible as a, a, as a president of his, uh, the his, United States. His polling is at rock bottom and there's an election about a year away. So I think that, again, could play into this scenario. And Israel will probably... I mean, there's, there's a military clock that's ticking, but there's also a political clock that's ticking. And Israel is very aware of those two things. And the political clock depends on what's going on in America. So I think at some point, Joe Biden will realize that he's just losing so much popularity here that he's going to have to curtail Israel to some extent. And that's why I think Israel knows that perhaps it's got another month more to go uh, before it can stop its genocide. Now, in terms of uh, escalations that we're seeing as a result of Israel's aggression on Gaza, uh, there, are, there are escalations happening here in the UK as well, mm. political escalations. There was a vote recently on an amendment, a ceasefire vote, essentially, uh, in the British Parliament, and all MPs were required to vote on whether or not they backed a ceasefire. Mm. Mm. Um, that happened uh, some days ago now. But the results of that and the lack of support that the motion received, specifically from some British Muslim MPs has caused an absolute backlash, particularly among British Muslims who have expressed yeah. strong outrage, strong condemnation of those specific MPs, uh, some of which uh, stood against the ceasefire motion, like they voted against it. Some just abstained. They wouldn't get involved. Same thing. And it's been seen as the same thing. Now, there's been a protest happening up and down the country, targeting these MPs, targeting their constituencies. And now there's talk of potential uh, a campaign being launched to try and out them from their position, to try and send them packing mm. politically. It looks to me, Roshan, as if there is a revolution underway here in the UK, a Muslim-led revolution uh, where Muslims are turning their back on the Labour Party for the first time. Yes. Just give us a bit of context about this and why I think a Muslim uh, boycott of Labour would be so significant in British politics. So the MPs, I think there were about five or six uh, Muslim MPs that uh, either voted against a ceasefire uh, or abstained, which I would say the same thing. I mean, I think two or three of them were conservative MPs like Sarkib, Batty and uh, somebody else. We kind of expect that from the Tories. Like if, you're, if you're a Muslim and you're a member of the Conservative Party, uh, I mean, I think we can draw obvious, without making takfir of people, it's pretty obvious what kind of Muslim you are. So we, we don't, we're not surprised about those people. But the Labour Party, um, you know, these are MPs like Rishnara Ali, Shabana Mahmood, Tulip Sadiq. You know, Shabana Mahmood um, and Rishnara Ali representing Labour constituencies, a big Muslim area. Um, I mean, these are people that have gone out and, and protested for Palestine in the past. I mean, now it looks like pretty hypocritically. So, I mean, where is their humanity? I mean, even leaving aside the religious obligation to, you know, sympathize with your brothers and sisters in Palestine who are getting bombed and, and massacred and genocided, um, leaving aside all of that, I mean, where is their humanity? I mean, even a non-Muslim, there are lots of non-Muslims that voted for a ceasefire. Even a non-Muslim can see what's going on, that the fellow human beings are being massacred by this outrageous uh, assault by this illegitimate state and where is their humanity it looks very much as though I know that Rushnara Ali and Shabana Mahmood are front bench shadow members it looks very much as though they have put their careers ahead of the uh, people of Palestine ultimately who are being massacred and uh, just to expand on that point, so uh, the Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, who has expressed on camera support for Israel's mm. uh, genocidal mm. policy of a total siege, a medieval style total siege on Gaza, by the way, as well as supporting uh, the, the, or not supporting calls for a ceasefire. He's made his position on that very, very clear. Uh, he threatened his front bench MPs yes. that he could he basically uh, put them on the back benches if they supported uh, this call for a ceasefire. And uh, as you mentioned, it looks like these certain MPs, these Muslim MPs have decided to pick 
the Labour Party over uh, the Quran and the Sunnah, basically, over the Ummah, over their uh, uh, responsibilities as Muslims. Before you speak again, Roshan, I'm, I went to the protest outside Roshanara Ali's okay. HQ in Tower Hamlets, East London, to witness the protest. And I'm going to play out some of the reactions of her local constituents who mm. are outraged and see exactly what they have to say. Cause the betrayal of our MP, Roshanara Ali. We're here. We won her out. We voted her in with a good, clean heart that she's going to support us. Today is a day that she hasn't supported us. She's broken our heart. She's broken the community. All we want from her, we need, we need her to go. And the sad reality is how can Rushnara Ali help us when she supports the killing of babies? In Labour Party, you can go to hell. We're not with you no more. I'm telling everybody that knows my face that is from Tower Hamlets, don't support Labour Party. Labour Party is history for us. They don't do any good for us. They're the same as Conservative. This is my personal view, Go vote for Green Party. At least they'll save the environment, we'll live easy, we'll eat good. I'm not a politician, I don't do politics, but I vote Green Party, don't support genocide. And really one of the things that shows about her is two things that, are, that really came to my mind last night. Number one, heartless. Like how are you going to put your own career over the deaths of children in Gaza? Regardless if you say that you resigned over the Iraq war, regardless of what's happened, all of that is taken away, all of that is forgotten, and she can't use that as leverage and excuse why she put herself, why she, she, she abstained from the vote yesterday. And secondly, it shows gutless, because she couldn't go against Keir Starmer, who really, you can see whose side he's on, and really and truly, they both and the party is going to remember in history what's, where they really stood in this genocide. I think. So, Roshan, uh, again, let me put into perspective just how important Muslims have been for the UK Labour Party. It was seen as mm. their entry into politics. The Labour Party has always identified as the party for minorities in this country. Now, millions of Muslims across the UK see Labour as the enemy for probably the first time since I've been around. You know, I don't ever remember Muslims looking at the Labour Party with such hostility yeah. as literally their enemy. And do you really think that they could uh, seriously punish the Labour Party in the next general election? I think Roshanara Ali, Shabana Mahmood, Tulip Sadiq. I mean, uh, I'm not sure Tulip Sadiq's constituency, I'm not sure whether it's a major Muslim area or not, but I think Roshanara Ali and Shabana Mahmood are finished in the eyes of the Muslim community. Um, gone, you know, literally. Um, I, I, I personally think we should launch a campaign, you know, to, and Five Pillars has a role to play in this in spreading awareness, uh, to make sure that Muslims never vote Labour again. Uh, any Muslim that is a member of the Labour Party now needs to resign, uh, needs to give up. They cannot work from inside. These arguments of changing the system from within do not wash with the community you know you are just preserving your careers um, so that you can have some influence within inside a corrupt system that basically um, advocates for the genocide of your brothers and sisters you know we no Muslim should be a member of the Labour Party a Labour councillor a Labour MP etc etc we need to leave this party we need to punish this party for what it's done to us okay for the fact that they've taken us for granted so this is a campaign that we're going to be running and uh, I'm not, um, I think the Labour Party will probably win the next election come what may, simply because it's the kind of fag end of the Tory era, you know. Um, however, I think in certain constituencies, the Muslim vote can come into play and we must make sure that we make that vote count and we punish the MPs, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, um, that have basically disregarded our wishes and have been complicit and have blood on their hands when it comes to Palestine. I think that Muslims have always had a lot of power, uh, given the fact that we have a large number of us mm. in the UK. Some constituencies, as you've mentioned, have a very strong concentration of Muslims in that community. Uh, there is a lot of power in our community, but it's, we've never been able to utilise it because of, you know, squabbles and division within our uh, ranks and things like that. But on Palestine, it's a red line issue. All Muslims red agree line. on that. Absolutely. All Muslims agree on that. And we're going to discuss shortly about uh, Five Pillars event that we held recently, which brought Muslims yeah. of all 
all different sects and denominations uh, into one room and they all decided that they were going to stand together on this issue and who knows if we can push that into the political realm as well get Muslims to move in one direction for Palestine I think that we have real power to punish uh, the Labour Party especially because you know if boycotts are going to work you have to pick your targets effectively you have to hit a brand or yeah. a company a which actually relies well. on you yes yeah. absolutely which actually relies yeah. on you and the Labour Party definitely does they the Labour Party I'm happy to say are clearly panicking mm. by the re reaction of Muslims so far. We just need to make sure that their fear, uh, their, their stutter, their, their, their uh, sh shaking in their boots is maintained right up until the general election, and we may even be able to pull out some... Can I make one? There. I mean, uh, I don't want to fundraise off the back of suffering, but I think this is another reason why Muslims need to support us, Five Pillars, uh, because it's really important that we get a community that is organised. Uh, a disorganised community is not an effective community, and we have a crucial role in spreading awareness about what's going on. Uh, we're reaching millions of people through our videos, especially since the, the beginning of this Gaza, Gaza crisis. We're offering news, analysis, viral videos, amazing podcasts. Dilly's doing an amazing job with his Blood Brothers, kind of events which are absolutely packed out. The community needs to put its money put its uh, hands in its pocket and support Five Pillars because you can see the job that we're doing. And very quickly, it's not because, you know, th th we just want them to support us only. No. We want Muslims to invest in themselves, mm. not invest in the Labour Party and these Zionist organisations who claim to represent Muslims. Support yourselves. And one way to do that is support Five Pillars because we're grassroots. We represent community views on this. We're not state-backed. We're not associated to any non-Muslim groups or organisations as far as mm. I am aware. Uh, so no. we are a Muslim organisation representing Muslims and we just want to empower Muslims, empower us, yeah. uh, defend Islam and obviously stand up for Palestine. But before mm. we move on to the next talking point, there is something which uh, Five Pillars uh, caused a bit of a stir with oh, yeah. last week. In fact, it was you and me that caused this stir. It was our uh, comments on Jeremy Corbyn specifically, yes. comments we made, we were uh, considered, it was considered quite harsh in all honesty. Jeremy Corbyn used to be part of the Labour Party, he's always been pro-Palestine, always been a friend of the Muslim community, however we criticised the guy mm. uh, and uh, it did cause a bit of a stir online among our own viewers as well who thought that we were being out of order basically following that Piers Morgan interview which was a car crash interview in all honesty for Jeremy Corbyn but people still th wondered why we were going in so hard on him. Roshan respond, I blame you for that. I retract nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I retract nothing. Uh, it's like in. we, uh, some, I mean, first of all, I think our viewers and readers are divided on this issue. It's not as if they're all Jeremy Corbyn fans, but I think a significant minority probably are. Uh, and it's still a hangover from that period where, you know, the Muslim community got behind him and voted for him. I voted for him twice yeah, as so well. I did. I did. Yeah. I was a Labour member under him as well. So, uh, But it's like we insulted somebody's mum or dad or <laughs> grandpa and we didn't. You know, it's ultimately, I think, um, I, I think the most convincing argument I heard against what we said um, is that some of the language we used was a little bit over the top. Uh, considering it was somebody who has spoken out for Muslims in Palestine. Uh, that was you, basically, not me. Um, the, other th the other convincing argument I heard is that now is not the time to alienate allies. We need uh, Muslim allies and non-Muslim allies in this struggle that we are, you know, fighting for the Palestinian cause. So maybe our timing was wrong. That is actually the most convincing argument I've heard. But in terms of what I said, I don't retract a single word because I think, honestly, uh, obviously I, I know Jeremy Corbyn a little bit personally. I've interviewed him many times. I saw how he ignored uh, the Palestinians when he was in power as Labour leader, mm. and even Muslims. Uh, he, he, he didn't, wouldn't give us interviews. He hardly talked about Palestine when he was actually Labour leader. When he had that power, he hardly talked about Palestine, and I'm completely sure about that. Mm. Uh, he threw certain of his friends under the bus, like Ken Livingston, like Mark, Mark Wadsworth and other people. These are friends Jackie of him. Walker. Jackie Walker. He threw them under the bus These as are they were accused a completely erroneously of anti-Semitism. He threw them under the bus. They're hardcore friends and supporters of Muslims in Palestine too, Exactly, by the way. and since leaving um, uh, the, the Labour Party, um, and so, since stepping down as Labour Party leader, again, he's continued to ignore his Muslim friends. Not completely, but, but generally he's downplayed these issues. At the same time, I understand that he does amplify so, certain pro-Palestine messages. So that's my clarification. The final thing I would say, Robert, is that 
what does the audience want of us? Does the audience want us to be robots talking seriously about every story? Or, you know, this, this show is about showing our personalities to, to a certain extent. Mm. And sometimes our personalities are a little bit obnoxious sometimes. And a little bit, you know, we, we joke around and there's a bit of banter. And this is what this show is all about. So if the audience doesn't want us to show our personalities, then this ain't the show for them. Sure. And I, I will, again, I'll add to that because, again, I was pretty harsh on Corbyn, probably more harsh than you, I would say. Mm. Why was that? Maybe I didn't explain why I came in so hard. Maybe it was a bit of a shock for people. I used to campaign for Corbyn. I was a Labour member for a, a couple of years. I really invested. I believed in Jeremy Corbyn. I really, really did. Yeah. Like, passionately so. And I literally went out, tried my best. I, I helped to out um, and to bring down one of his uh, treacherous backbench MPs, Joan Ryan. You remember that, Roche. Mm. Anyone who can check out that story, Robert Carter, Joan Ryan, it will come up straight away. It was a big story at the time. I literally invested everything I had in Jeremy Corbyn. Corbyn. And when I saw the purge of the Palestinian solidarity movement within the Labour Party under his watch, under the, his watch, the appeasement, the apologies, uh, the the sickening, uh, the it was sickening. acknowledgement of this weaponization of anti-Semitism that was used against him, he nodded along and apologised for it as if it was a legit argument to make, which it never was. He gave it um, fuel. He gave, he it gave fuel. them. He gave them ground. He backpedalled. He showed weak leadership in that regard, certainly. And I have to say that he has to. To take responsibility for that as the former leader who who the purges of Palestine solidarity in Labour happened initially under his watch. That's when it began. Didn't it didn't begin under Keir Starmer. He, he, We're going he, in he harder than we did last week. <laughs> well, I, I'm explaining. I'm explaining why, and I think it needs to be said. And I think if people just understand that, yeah. they'll understand why I went in so hot. But it, it's because after seeing that interview, I kept quiet on Jeremy Corbyn for so long. Mm. Kept quiet on it. But after seeing that uh, weak performance on the Piers Morgan interview, I had to say something because I was so frustrated. Right now, Palestine hasn't got room for weak and wobbly performances. They are under attack. It's a genocide. You've seen all the pictures of mm. parents holding their limp, uh, dis uh, dismembered, uh, destroyed uh, ch children's bodies and burying them. Over 14,000 killed. We haven't got time for these poor performances. We need champions. We need men at arms. We need soldiers to go on the media and hit back hard. Piers Morgan was obviously going to give Corbyn a hard time and all he did was put in what was a weak performance. And I'm sorry if that offends people, but I felt like I had to vent there because yeah. I, I just I just was not in the mood to put when up When you say men nonsense. at arms going on the media, you don't mean literally going on there carrying a Kalashnikov, do you? <laughs> no, yeah. uh, oh, sorry, did I not condemn Hamas? Uh, just in case everyone didn't hear it. Oh, I should have worn your sign, Roshan. Uh, uh, look, we need we need we need yeah. people who are going to defend uh, the Palestinians unapologetically, so bravely, so courageously, so. And I think that's going to move on nicely into the next segment. Can I say one more thing? Yeah, I think absolutely. also that I think uh, our audience. I mean, our audience is amazing, and you know, most of the comments we get are are wonderful, etc. Et I love our audience. I yeah, love our audience. Like, yeah, like passionately. Yeah. so. I'm in love with you guys. <laughs> but uh, we, we've got to have some tolerance. Of, we're always going to differ over certain things. Like, you and me differ over certain things and as long as we're not crossing red lines where we're advocating the haram you yeah. know i think we should be tolerant of our differences yeah and we shouldn't throw our trolley uh, our, our prams out the trolleys trolleys out the prams <laughs> babies out the trolleys whatever it is i'll get there eventually <laughs> no i think yeah uh, absolutely right Let, let's put this to bed now <laughs> what is that babies out of trolleys <laughs> yeah toys or, out of prams or whatever it is prams, i don't know what it is <laughs> but <laughs> yeah don't throw babies anyone <laughs> but uh, let's move on to the next segment because this is where five pillars is, was at its best i think mm. uh, an event that was held oh, yeah. uh, five pillars event that was held in uh, bedford uh, the uh, home territory of dili hussein the islamic um, republic of bedford <laughs> yeah exactly we held uh, an event there for palestine for gaza uh, inside the local masjid and uh, there were a, th a couple of thousand people showed up at least well it was supposed to be 500 but i think uh, it was probably about a thousand yeah, yeah absolutely so it, but we can numbers. say a couple of thousand we packed out a million venue. people came we <laughs> <laughs> we packed out the venue. We packed out the venue. And let's hear from uh, Dili Hussein now. People ask me, Brother Dili, why this, why this venue? Why here? I'll tell you why. Because events like these are being cancelled up and down the country. Up and down the country because venues are buckling under the pressure of the Zionist lobby and the way they have weaponized public servicemen like the police. Many of you know I had detectives visiting myself just a couple of weeks ago. So Allah Akbar. To Westbourne Islamic Center, let's have three takbirs. Takbir! 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 
and, and I encourage, I encourage masajid and Islamic centers up and down the country to take the lead and the example that my local community has, alhamdulillah. Six weeks, six weeks, brothers and sisters, we have witnessed the genocidal, brutal, ethnic cleansing of our brothers and sisters in Gaza by the occupying Zionist entity of Israel. What I'm about to tell you doesn't even touch the 75-year occupation or what's happening in the occupied West Bank where thousands have been imprisoned, thousands have been killed, and thousands of houses have been demolished and handed over to armed Jewish-Israeli settlers. So that was just a small glimpse of Dilly's mm. talk. We had a fantastic lineup of speakers on the day. They were just as passionate as each other, angry. They said the right things. They said what needed to be said. And what I loved about this event so much is because uh, the mainstream media routinely ignores and censors this type of viewpoint, legitimate, real Muslim views in support of Palestine mm. on this occasion. And we provided uh, and facilitated a place where these views could finally be heard, finally be put online as we have been doing on our platform, Five Pillars, and for the audience to come together and share in that and to learn from it and to benefit from it. Uh, this is desperately needed now. This is desperately needed. L like I said, the, the Palestinians are literally fighting a fight for survival. The Israeli regime is going for the total destruction and annihilation of not only mm. Palestine, but the Palestinian culture, everyone who, who, who is Palestinian that wants to stay in their land. They want to kill them or expel them. And we need people who are going to speak the truth. And the mainstream media is not going to do that. And I applaud Dilly. I applaud you. I applaud Five Pillars. I'm the new guy here. I won't take any credit. It was for actually Dilly that organised it. It was event. All, I did very all Dilly and all of the other yeah. speakers who were brave. They said things which are going to get slammed online by uh, the right wing, by the establishment, by uh, pro-Israel uh, mm. activists and lobbyists. They're going to get slammed. They're going to get demonised. They're going to be called uh, terror sympathisers and all that type of stuff. But do you know what? They went on there and they said it, and they said it raw. I think um, something Loki said uh, really struck home with me. He said the stakes are really, really high this time. And, you know, are we going to be the generation that loses Masjid al-Aqsa? That's literally the stakes. Yeah. You know, uh, the stakes could not be higher. Um, it, it calls out for bravery. It calls out for organization. It calls out for cleverness as well. And um, yeah, it was an amazing event. I mean, the last event the Five Pillars held was about six years ago, and we had about 50 people in a small room. So packed out a whole center. And I think that's because of the strength of feeling, not because of Five Pillars, but the strength of feeling over Palestine. Um, and what was amazing as well, I think, was the diversity of people that were there, especially amongst the speakers and the, the scholars that turned up, some of whom didn't speak, but they were there anyway. Um, and, you know, we, we had a very wide section of the, the Sunni community, Barelvis, Deobandis, Salafis, um, et cetera, et cetera. And they were all in one room, basically, yeah, um, for Palestine. Yeah. And, and that doesn't happen very often, you know, believe it or not. You know, the, the Deobandis and the Barelvis, they can literally have, you go to some of these northern towns, there's a, a, a Deobandi mosque, then there's a Barelvi mosque, they never interact with each other. So alhamdulillah, that, that sense of unity was something amazing. And perhaps we can, we can build on that. I think everyone responded positively to it. I know that uh, clips are being uploaded all over the place online, including on the speaker's own uh, social media platforms. It's being watched by hundreds of thousands of people. This was just a taste of what Muslims all across the country mm. should be doing. I hope they follow suit because, as I've said a few times in this show, the Palestinians need help. They need help. They need drastic action. Peaceful, drastic action. I have to say peaceful because, as you know, we mm. always everyone assumes that we're a bunch of terrorists. But we we need to support the Palestinians. And this uh, uh, government, this country specifically, is literally invested in supporting Israel, uh, no matter how far it goes, because. Britain basically started it. Britain is an imperialist, colonialist power, and Israel is the uh, is the the biggest colonialist project that's ongoing in our day and age. They say that colon the age of colonialism and imperialism has gone now. The British Empire is finished and all that type of stuff. Mm. It's happening now, Roshan. It's happening literally in front of our eyes. What's happening in Gaza, in occupied Palestine, is a genocide, ethnic cleansing. It, it's a massacre, and it's literally happening. And not only that, but uh, the third holiest site in Islam is being desecrated on a regular basis. We need 
to, to, we need to reach a new level here. We need to really form some kind of pressure to force a change. Uh, and the, the only way it's going to be achieved is through action like this. We need to bring Muslims together and make a yeah. joint strategy here. I, and I'm glad that Five Pillars is doing I, that. I think that the last thing I want to say about this is that Muslims also have to realise that effective activism comes with a personal cost. Uh, cost of perhaps losing your job, um, the cost of perhaps being demonised in the media, etc., etc. Now, what we are going through in this country pales into insignificance. Whatever happens to us in this country, the worst thing that might happen to us pales into insignificance compared to what's happening to our brothers and sisters in Palestine who are losing uh, relatives, their lives, uh, their limbs, etc., uh, etc. Et so uh, we should be, all, all I would say is that as Muslims, we have to be ready to pay a cost. Do not think that you, you can do your activism, wave your Palestinian flag, and nothing will happen to you. And then you can go back to your job and watching your sports and, you know, having your shishas every... This is not the time for that. This is the time for sacrifice. And we need to sacrifice in the cause of Palestine. Absolutely. Uh, there is, of course, so much more to discuss, as always, but uh, we are out of time on this edition of our Reaction Programme. Just to update you guys, uh, we have been promising for a week or so now to upgrade the quality of this show by launching it officially as we Can it be upgraded? Be. Can the quality get any better? I'm not sure <laughs> the, the, co the, the contributors uh, can't be updated, but we're, what we're hoping to do is get you guys involved more directly in the show uh, by having perhaps a call in. Uh, obviously, we'll fix it up uh, on a graphics uh, design level. Level, but that will be launched very, very soon, hopefully, inshallah, next week. So do stay tuned. This is going to be a regular feature appearing on Five Pillars exclusively going forward, and it's only going to get better. And I'll tell you why, because you guys are going to be directly contributing and speaking with us in the future, inshallah. So do stay tuned. Uh, but for this edition, we've come to an end. But make sure you leave your comments in the comments section below. Like, share, and subscribe. It helps the channel immensely. And we will be responding in the comments section below, inshallah. Take care. And until next time, next week, I'll catch you again. Ma'asalaamu for now. Assalamu alaikum.